Alrighty folks, and welcome to the Conical Podcast channel. This is episode 44, Brotherly Love. Now before we get into today's podcast episode, um, I will say a big sorry for not really posting anything for the past month basically. I've certainly not made any new episodes in a month. And the reason why is because a family member of mine was in hospital he had some leg problems and things and yeah it just like I couldn't really concentrate I was too busy thinking about uh, that and yeah just started slouching around and things just thinking of the worst and that's the thing if I was back home I would never have I would I would have been continuing to do podcast episodes and things but the difference is I wasn't there so you always think of the worst and logic and reason goes out the window so I just couldn't do it um, so yeah, sorry about that. And um, the second thing I'll say before I begin is we are witnessing history unfold before our very eyes today. Uh, you know, a couple of days ago, President Putin invaded Ukraine. And yeah, we're just now going to see what happens with what else Putin's got planned. And of course, the country that I'm in now, people are watching what they're doing. And let's just hope that World War III doesn't isn't around the corner. And yeah, thoughts and prayers out to all those in Ukraine. I mean, I've got a couple of Ukrainian friends here in Beijing, so I know they're not doing too well right now. And yeah, hopefully this gets resolved soon and peacefully. But I you know, let's just hope that's what's going to happen. But anyway, this is an episode about Chinese history and not about politics. So I just wanted to say the message and now get into what today's topic is all about. So in today's podcast episode, we will be looking at how the Tang Dynasty immediately had problems upon seizing power in the year 618. The first of these problems was that the empire they inherited was still divided. It's not like the peasantry and the renegade leaders simply said, oh, another royal family has replaced this one. Let's put down our arms. But, of course, that just wasn't the case. You know, there was there was real contenders for power. And the Tang, when they first stepped into the scene, they weren't exactly the top dogs. And they had to fight their way to the top. Um, so basically, the... The Yang family, like the Sui dynasty, the emperor was in the south of China when he heard that Li Yuan had rebelled and that he had now taken Chang'an. And he was shortly assassinated, like not long after that. And then once he was dead, there was a clear path for Li Yuan to declare himself emperor, which is what he did. And the other problem that the Tang dynasty faced was more to do with internal politics, particularly between the Emperor Gaozu's sons. Uh, you had Li Jiancheng, who was the crown prince because he was the eldest. You had Li Shumin, who was the brightest of the three like contenders and who was clearly the most capable of the three. And then, of course, you have Li Yuanji, who was uh, a bit of a... Well, let's just, let's just say he wasn't exactly close to his two brothers um, in terms of intelligence or capability for that matter. But he was in cahoots with Li Jiancheng and tried to remove the biggest threat to him, which was Li Shumin. And I think what his plan was, was that once he deals with Li Shumin, him and Li Jiancheng would like juke it out basically. But it doesn't get to that, which we will soon see why. Um, so I was trying to break it down in a way where we talk about the rebellions and then the internal politics, but the two kind of like intertwine. So what you'll see is more like a chronological story as to how we get to the climax of this rivalry that develops between Li Jiancheng and Li Shumin. Um, so we'll just like, you'll just, you'll see how it goes down. So like I said, the newly established Tang Dynasty still had rebellions to deal with. But the difference between the Tang and the Sui dynasty was that the Tang actually wanted to put the rebellions down and re-establish order. The Sui emperor really had a reputation for not wanting to hear anyone 
talk about rebellions and even executed a couple of ministers for daring to utter a word about it at all. The Tang Dynasty, however, was a totally different kettle of fish. Li Yuan knew about the rebellions and wanted to bring those rebels to heel. For starters, Li Yuan had two rival dynasties to deal with who proclaimed that they had the mandate of heaven and who had broken away from the Sui courts. Now let it be noted that there were actually nine contenders for power overall here, but the two biggest rivalries were the Xia dynasty under the leadership of Dou Jiandu and the Zhong dynasty under the leadership of Wang Shuchong. The Xia dynasty is not to be confused with the semi-mythical one that was way at the beginning of this podcast, uh, but they were up in the northeast of the Sui Empire, whereas the Zhang Dynasty was directly to the east of the Emperor and Chang'an. Another external threat the Tan faced, of course, were the eastern Turkic Khaganates to the north. However, Li Yuan had an ace up his sleeve, his second son, Li Shumin. Another contender, the Qin, to the north of the newly established Tang, were the closest of these enemies, and Li Shumin was sent to defeat this threat. And after a little bit of back and forth, Li Shimin was victorious and secured what was formerly the Qin. Afterwards, the Tang Dynasty shifted its gaze east. Li Shimin and the youngest of Li Yuan's sons, Li Yuan Ji, marched east to fight the Zhang Dynasty. When the two sides met up at Hulao Gate, the Xia Dynasty, under the leadership of Zhou Do Jianda, thought it was a good time to take advantage of the Zheng's distraction and swept down south. However, Li Shimin managed to take a small force around the battle that was going on at Hulao Pass, take the fight to the Xia, and defeated them, capturing Do Jianda in the process. As a result, Li Shimin was the hero of the entire campaign, and he expanded the Tang to be the big boy on the block now. So for all to see, it was Li Shimin who was bringing about this great age, this great period of expansion, and rapid expansion at that, uh, for the Tang Dynasty. And, you know, they were moving from strength to strength, and it was all because of Li Shimin. But of course, with this success, there was another problem. Li Shimin was the guy who expanded the Tang Empire, and the one who brought stability. But what about his elder brother? Would he feel good about this? Well, of course not. Li Jianchong was furious all the glory was going to his younger brother. He was the crown prince after all. Where was his glory? It wasn't just Li Jianchong who felt this way, but even his father as well. In order to make him look more capable of running the empire, the advisors of the crown prince, as well as the emperor, agreed that the eldest son had to take on the next campaign. And of course, it had to be an easy one. By the 7th of November, 622, the Crown Prince got his opportunity, when Emperor Galzu issued the order that he was to be the commander-in-chief of the expeditionary force to the east and of all Tang forces to the east of Xiaoshan Mountain, which is like east of Shaanxi and like west of Hunan. The reason why he was going there was because he had to deal with a rebellion led by a man named Liu Hei Ta, who was besieging Weizhou. Li Jianchong accepted the order willingly, took the youngest brother, Li Yuanji, Ji, with him, and together they marched to defeat the enemy army. Now, like I said, they were hoping for an easy victory, and pretty much they got an easy victory. And of course, the two brothers were coming back victorious. After said easy victory, the two brothers allied together against their sibling, as they seen Li Shimin as the biggest threat to their power. Li Jianchang began building up his own private army that he called his bodyguard unit without informing the emperor, which was a big no-no. You're not supposed to do that. And further to that, he got close to the concubines of Emperor Galzu. And I mean really close. Let's just put it this way. Emperor Galzu, or Tang Galzu, was, you know, in his 50s. And Li Jianchang was in his 20s. And Emperor Galzu was very happy to surround himself with the young, beautiful women. And of course, they're all going to want to go with the younger model, especially considering that he is the current prince. So, Li Jianchang used these connections with the concubines, and basically, they were singing all the praises of Li Jianchang whilst demonizing the second son, Li Shumin. 
Li Jianchang was slowly but surely slipping poison into the ears of his father against his rival, and Li Shimin became further and further isolated away from the emperor. The emperor then went on to say about Li Shimin, This boy has stayed away from me for a long time. He would rather command armies and fight on the frontiers. He pays too much attention to the literati. He is no longer the son I knew in the old days. So based on what Tang Galzu is saying there, you can see that there's a, there's a rift developing between the two of them. And, um, you know, like, you've got to give credit to Li Jianchang. He's trying to use his influence to make sure that he becomes the current prince. With the brothers engaging in what was clearly becoming a bitter rivalry, it was clear to the court officials that they better side with one of them soon. Li Yuan had internal as well as external problems to deal with. There were still contenders for supremacy in China that needed to be dealt with, but there was also this question of succession as well. Who should succeed Li Yuan? Confucian values obviously dictated that Li Jianchang should be the next emperor. However, it was pretty clear to everyone that it was the second son, Li Xumin, who was the man for the job. Li Jianchang was an okay leader, don't get me wrong. By all accounts, he was an honest and noble man who enjoyed the pleasures of the inner court. Whereas Li Xumin, on the other hand, like his father said, was much more connected to his ancestors from the north in terms of horse riding, archery, and fighting. And, like, learning the Confucian classics and things. That's what Li Shimin did. And, you know, Li Shimin was just a man. He was clever, creative, open-minded, daring, decisive, and caring, apart from when it came to his own family members. Now, Li Shimin was the man who would bring about the good times for all within China, and for those who sided with him, they seen that. Some people even compared him to Liu Bang, the founder of the Han Dynasty. So, I mean... There's a lot, of, a lot of praise for this guy. But before the showdown would really come clambering down within the dynasty, another external force pushed the issue of succession to the back burner for the moment. Those northern Turks were causing trouble once again and launching invasions into Tang, China. By 624, Jia Li Khan and Tu Li Khan were launching raids into modern-day Gansu province and causing a huge cause of concern for the Tang court. Not wanting to risk his crown prince and wanting to test Li Shimin, who had made a boast to his father that he would conquer the northern desert within 10 years, he decided that Li Shimin should lead the army to counter this northern threat. As the Tang army marched toward Jia Li and Tu Li's encampments, the rains began to pour, and the two armies were completely soaked down in a boggy mess near the village of Binxian, which surprised both armies as they never expected, expected to meet there in Shaanxi province. But yet, yeah, here they were. Li Shimin wanted to charge the enemy, but the youngest brother, who had to come with them, Li Yuanji, was there and he wanted to hold caution. He argued that the Tang were outnumbered and should withdraw. However, Li Shimin made his own counter and said that they had protected their bows and arrows from the rain, whereas their en enemies would have been unable to do such a thing. So they had the advantage. Now, for those of you who do not know, if you've got a lot of archers and their bows get soaked, they're not very good after that. They need time to dry. And Li Shimin had predicted the rain and he managed to protect the bows and arrows. Whereas he knew his enemy wouldn't have been able to do that. So... Wanting to seize the advantage, Li Shimin then rode out with the 100 heavy cavalry forces to face the Turks. And here he shouted across the enemy lines, You pledge friendship with the Tang. You promised not to invade our lands. Here you are. I am King of Qin, which was Li Shimin's title. Do you want to fight with me yourself? You and your force can attack us here, but we will fight. Do you dare? Now both Jia Li Khan and Tu Li Khan were silent. They didn't expect to meet Li Shimin personally in the battle. If it was one of the other brothers, it was fair game. But they knew that Li Shimin more than matched them. Maybe not in numbers, but definitely in strategy. Li Shimin also goaded Tu Li Khan in particular, reminding him of a small fact which I haven't mentioned yet, and here it is. 
Li Shimin and Tu Li had met way back in the Sui days. There was a possible bride, there was an archery contest, and drinking, then the two men became sworn brothers. Li Shimin used this to basically ask, would you fight your own brother? Again, silence. Li Shimin then went on to head the charge against the Turks. But as he and his men were picking up the pace, a messenger came out and said the Turks were withdrawing right away. The two sides backed off a little bit, and that was it. Later on that night, Li Shimin decided to use a little trickery, and to really send the message to both cans that he was not to be messed with. Under the cover of darkness, he quietly led his troops across what would have been their battlefield and encamped even closer to the Turks, basically tightening the noose around their necks. But before he could strike, in an emergency meeting, the cans decided to cut their losses and sue for peace with the Tang. And it was Tu Li who went out to meet Li Shumin and sort out the details. And there you have it. The Turks withdrew and the Tang didn't have to worry about them for some time yet. And, of course, the, all the credit went to Li Shimin, who managed to defeat those troublesome northern neighbours without losing a single soldier. Much better than his elder brother could ever have dreamed of. When the army returned to the capital, the succession crisis was back on. And soon, Li Jianchang and Li Yuanji conspired to have Li Shimin removed permanently. I mean, it made sense. Li Shimin was certainly the most favoured amongst the literati and the army. It would be easy for him to seize control once Daddy dies. So the brothers decided to get him killed before he could think about doing that. So when celebrating the victory in one of the imperial palaces, the brothers had managed to slip poison in Li Shimin's wine. And soon, the prince was sick. However, always the cautious man, Li Shimin didn't drink much of the poisoned wine, and once he started to feel its effects, he managed to excuse himself, got himself some help, went back to his own palace. He, was, he did start to be sick, and he even took, started being sick with blood and things, but he was given the antidote. Li Shimin was damp, but he wasn't dead. Now, upon hearing the news that Li Shimin had been poisoned by his own brother, the emperor was furious and gave his eldest son a good talking to. Yeah, way to go, Dad. Then, of course, he went on to see Li Shumin. The two spoke and rekindled that father-son bond, and they agreed that it may be best to let Li Shumin govern Luoyang as a viceroy, controlling the eastern portion of the empire, whilst the two brothers could govern the west from Chang'an. Now, the problem with that was, of course, that Li Jianchang and Li Yuanji don't want to do that. They didn't want to share, and they were horrified. Now, of course, it, I can see why they were horrified, because all of the best members of the court, they would all go to the east. They would all follow Li Shimin. And as well as that, Li Shimin would have more territory and he would have a larger portion of the population too. And of course, once this was decided and once Tang Gaozu died, it'd be very easy for Li Shimin to probably just march west and kill his brothers. So, of course, they were not happy with this and used their connections to make sure that this wasn't going to happen. And eventually Tang Gaozu just agreed. Now that they had dealt with that, they then decided, okay, we can't kill Li Shimin now because obviously their father is watching them. So they decided to make his position incredibly weak and isolate him. So what they tried to do was they tried to bribe his top advisors and like the, the military men who were close to him. And one such advisor was named Yu Chu Jin De. So what happened was the crown prince sent a whole bunch of silver to his house, accompanied with a letter saying, let's be friends. Seen through what this was, Yu Chu Jin De sent a letter back to the crown prince saying, I was born poor. My experiences are quite different from yours. When the Sui lost power, I joined a rebel gang. I committed crimes against the Tang forces. It was the King of Qin who saved me and gave me a new life. I am a commander in service to His Excellency. I repay his kindness with loyalty. I cannot accept your gift. I can have no secret dealings. Of course, your highness will agree that anyone who betrayed his master for gain is despicable. 
So when Li Jiancheng read the letter, he was of course furious and decided that Yu Chu Jingde had to be assassinated. So over the next few months, Yu Chu Jingde kept almost getting killed, but somehow he survived. Now of course he told Li Xumin about the attempted bribe and about the people trying to kill him, and Li Xumin actually told him that he should have taken the gift. <laughs> but the reason why he said that was he said, then you could have been an informant for me. But by then it was already too late. Um, eventually, the two brothers fixed their gaze elsewhere and they accused Li Ximin's cavalry commander of treason and they did it openly within the court. So of course, Emperor Galzu had to order an investigation and eventually, using their connections once again, Emperor Galzu ordered this general to serve on the frontiers, away from Li Ximin. But he actually refused and crying to his friend, his commander, he said, if arms and legs are cut off, how will your excellency survive? I stay at my post for you, even if I'm executed. So there you go. I mean, this is one thing that I suppose is inspiring because a lot of people get betrayed in ancient China, whereas Li Ximin managed to command the loyalty and respect of his subordinates. And it goes to show here when his two brothers are trying to bribe their way to get rid of their rivals. But the final straw came when raiders were besieging a city in Shanxi province. Normally, this kind of work would go to Li Ximin, but conspiring to get rid of his military power, the two brothers decided to strip him of that power. Using their influence over the emperor's concubines, Emperor Galzu decided that Li Yuanji lead the army to defeat the encroaching rebels. In simple terms, what this meant was that Li Ximin had to hand over his entire military authority over to his rival brother. The court officials close to Li Ximin started to get twitchy and it was clear that the brothers planned to remove his military power then kill him. The rivalry between the brothers was coming to a head. Li Ximin knew he needed to act now and summoned his trusted advisors to his palace. He asked them what they should do and in a chorus of all of them shouted, you should be emperor. They got into the usual trash talking of the other sons and how noble Li Ximin was in comparison to them. Li Ximin then wanted to see what heaven had to say about it, ordering to burn a tortoise shell and to decipher the cracks. But as soon as he was going to put the shell in the fire, a member of his personal staff, Zhang Gongjin, slapped a tortoise shell away saying, the purpose of divination is to gain heaven's help in making a decision. We do not need help. Are we just going to give up? And with that, Li Ximin agreed and then came up with the plan. The plan was simple. Make accusations that Li Jianchang and Li Yuanji were sleeping with the emperor's concubines, which it seems like they were anyway, then on their way to court, kill them both. The showdown would be at Xuanwu Gate. On the 3rd of June, 626, Li Ximin went to see his father and argued his case, saying, I have done nothing to harm them. They want to kill me. They are upset that my victories over Wang Shichong and Do Jianda have gained me fame. And then, of course, he started to say the concubine stuff, which the emperor cared about more, I believe. <laughs> so the emperor knew that there was some truth in it. And, you know, just look at the poisoning incident. It was pretty clear that the two brothers were acting rashly and doing everything they could to kill Li Ximin. So he did tell Li Ximin that he would summon the brothers to court the next morning to investigate the matter. Li Ximin's rival brothers got the news and heard that Ximin had made the accusations himself. So they were in a bit of a dilemma now. Do they not go and get accused of rebelling? Or take their guards and see what exactly is going on? And they decided to go for the latter. The next morning, on the 4th of June, Li Jiancheng and Li Yuanji left the Crown Prince's home and begun their journey to the Imperial Court. When they arrived at Xuanwu Gate, they felt something was amiss, so decided to turn back. 
But before they could, Li Ximing appeared at the gate and shouted, Why are you not going to court? In a panic, Li Yuanji ji pulled out his bow and shot three times at Li Ximing. But as he was panicked, his shots were erratic, wild and completely missed the mark. Li Ximing then pulled out his own bow and fired. Before he could even react, Li Jiancheng was hit by the arrow, knocked off his horse and dead. Li Ximing's men were already at Xuan Wu Gate, dressed up as Taoist monks, and soon descended on Li Yuanji and killed him. Once the deed was done, the two brothers were beheaded and their heads were taken to the imperial court. Startled, Emperor Gaozu asked who rebelled, but once he heard the news that it was Li Jiancheng and Li Yuanji who rebelled, and it was Li Ximing who had killed them, it was clear to all that Li Ximing held all of the power now. Emperor Gaozu ordered Li Ximing to the court and named him Crown Prince. The two of them cried over the loss of their sons or brothers, and whilst that was happening, Li Jiancheng's and Li Yuanji's concubines and children were being slaughtered. From that day forth, it was the Crown Prince Li Ximing who was running the empire. And by August the same year, Emperor Gaozu announced that he wanted to retire, and Li Ximing was the second emperor of the Tang Dynasty by the 8th of October. His beloved wife, Lady Jiang Sun, was named the Empress Dowager, and his eight year old son was named the Crown Prince. Now, Li Ximing may have taken the bloody route to power, but from the information I have read, it seems that it was necessary. Being an imperial family in ancient dynasty China was a dog-eat-dog -dog world. If you were soft, you would never make it to the top. And it was clear that Li Ximing was willing to do what was necessary to get to the top. And to be fair to him, he was certainly the most capable of Li Yuan's sons, and if he didn't take the throne, I'm pretty sure we wouldn't talk about the Tang Dynasty in such a way where it was really one of the pinnacles of achievements in ancient China. But we will discuss what Li Ximing, now Tang Taizong, as of 628, does as emperor in the next episode. So I want to thank you all for taking the time to listen to this podcast and be sure to share it wherever somebody shows a bit of interest in Chinese history. I would really appreciate it. And to all of you, thanks for listening.